Hello, welcome to Outlook Africa. My name is Robert Uncle Bob Oniyama. Outlook Africa is a social political talk show where we discuss issues affecting Africa and the black diaspora. Today we have a great son of Africa. He is the most sought after speaker on issues concerning Africa in the world today. He was a director of the Kenya Anti-Corruption Commission from September 2010 to August 2011. Since 2014, he has been the director of the Kenya School of Law. We're talking about Professor Patrick Lodge Otieno Lumumba, otherwise known as PLO Lumumba. Professor Lumumba, welcome to Outlook Africa. Thank you very much for the, interview, for the invitation. Thank you so much, sir. It's our pleasure. Um, I'm going to start uh, with a holistic question, uh, just a simple question, before we get into some other matters. Is Africa still redeemable? Africa is redeemable. You know, Africa is a continent with a long history, a long history which is checkered. She has had her golden moments. She has had her low moments. She has been the victim of slavery, the victim of colonization, currently the victim of neocolonization. But her resilience is unique among civilizations. And there is a sense, therefore, in which even the question, is she redeemable, is unfair. It suggests that she is uh, completely in the muck and mire of confusion. She, like other civilizations, is suffering in different, suffering in different ways. But the reality is that there are things that are happening to her which tells me that she is capable of realizing her true potential in the very near future. But our sons and daughters must work at it. All hands must be on deck. Good. Well, so that, that gives us hope, uh, especially for the young ones who uh, tune into uh, 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 our media here, Fever TV, uh, to, 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 to learn about Africa and uh, the future of Africa. Now, there's a lot of dependence on colonial ties in, the, in, the, in, in, in different countries in Africa, uh, even till today. And uh, the leadership track is always underpinned by, you know, and influenced by the colonial ex-masters. Uh, you yourself has, have said that the shortest route, uh, politics is the shortest route to unearned wealth in Africa. Um, with that, with that, problem of uh, the interference, foreign interference in the leadership in Africa, um, how are we going to change, bring about a change eventually? If, if you look at uh, the struggle for regaining our independence, which happened in earnest in the late 50s and then in the 60s and ultimately in the 70s, 80s and 90s, you, 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 you begin to see that the decision to grant independence to the post-colonial African state was, was influenced by agitation. And, and the erstwhile powers, the French, the British, the Germans, the Italians, the, the Belgians, the Spaniards did not do this willingly. And Kwame Nkrumah puts it very well. He says that imperialists always wear different masks but their DNA does not change. And that is why you see every institution that has been created by Africans has been undermined, not only at the continental level, but at the bilateral level. The most pernicious have been the French. Up till now, they describe their territories as the territoire de haute mer, the overseas territories. They use organizations such as the, the Commonwealth, these are post-colonial organizations whose grand agenda is to give the erstwhile colonial powers the opportunity to continue to interfere. And the question that you are asking is pregnant with, with very many uh, permutations. How will we get out of it? That there have been attempts designed to reduce the dependency on Western powers. The NEPAD, now Auda NEPAD, 
the Agenda 2063, which is now getting off rails, the Africa Continental Free Trade Area, this miasma of confusion. And yet again, we see the emergence of China. So sometimes it is easy to blame the colonialists. It is easy to blame these Eastern powers. It is easy to blame everybody else except ourselves. But to come back to your question, which you also prefaced with a statement that I've made before, many African politicians, I'm reluctant to use the word leader or leaders, <laughs> have used their office, which is an office of honor and privilege to enrich themselves and to abandon the grand agenda. You will be familiar with this because you are a student of history and political science. Listen to any of the early speeches of Nkrumah, of Nyerere, of Keita, of Kaunda, of Ahmed Ben Bella, or Patrice Emery Lumumba, of Nambi Azikiwe, or even Tafawa Balewa, or Bafemi Awolowo, and you saw men and not very many women who knew what they wanted. But today, you listen to the speeches which are being made by our leaders, very performa, very perfunctory. You can pick and choose those who are speaking to the things that uh, really address the African issues. In the recent past, it's only people like Samora Moises Michel. I see Paul Kagame sometimes comes out quite strongly. I see John Pombe Magufuli does that. Akufo Ado does come up quite strongly. Yoweri Museveni, whether you like him or not, does come up quite strongly. Hag again, Gob in Namibia. But aside from those very few, the African politician sees the instrument of state as an instrument of self-aggrandizement. And we who are the population, the tragedy is that we ourselves allow ourselves to be mobilized from an ethnic perspective. We are mobilized ethnically or we are bribed into taking positions. And going forward, how can we liberate ourselves from that is through this thing called civic education. But not civic education as defined to us by Western NGOs. Exactly. It is civic education which empowers us to recognize our interests and to work at them by making demand of the political class. And that is easier said than that, but we can do it. In the recent past, I've seen the people of Sudan driving Omar el-Bashir out of power when he thought that he was a rock of ages who could not be moved. Exactly. I've seen the president of Mali being driven out. So it can be done. If the results may not as quick, be as quick and as dramatic as we desire. To piggyback on that, uh, there's been um, a call in some quarters, especially in the Pan-Africanist quarters, uh, about uh, looking at the consolidation of African countries into larger entities. Uh, recently, even though it was denied, um, the, prior, uh, the foreign minister of Nigeria claimed that Benin, uh, that the, co the president of Benin actually uh, 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 was asking if it's possible for Benin to become the 37th state of Nigeria. Uh, your friend, Dr. Arikana Shimbori Kwao, uh, had suggested that you can't have Togo or Benin negotiating with France. Are there too many countries in Africa presently? is what I'm trying to ask you in a roundabout way. And there, should there be some consolidation of these smaller, uh, there are. too many countries in Africa? <laughs> and there should there be consolidation of these African countries into larger entities? You know, I'm going to answer your question directly and also in a roundabout way. You know, when, when I, uh, in, in, in the month of May in 1963, and I invite you to read the speeches that were delivered on the 24th and 25th day of May, 1963, on the occasion of the creation of the Organization of African Unity. David Dako, who was the then president of Central African Republic, responds to the Osage Sababa on that day, because it created an opportunity for Central African Republic to belong to a, a big thing which empowered him to negotiate with France, with France, which was the former colonial power. 
But it is it both Nyerere and Nkrumah, but particularly Nkrumah who said, please let us get out of this place with one government. Let us get out of this place with a, a decision that we are going to create a united Africa. Its capital should either be in Bangui in Central African Republic or Leopold now Kinshasa in the Democratic Republic of Congo, because if we don't, you are going to get used to the privileges that your little countries offer as presidents and inspecting guards of honor, and it will be very difficult for you to now get into a larger hole. And today we can see it. Yeah. If you look at the little countries and you've given Togo and Benin, the truth is, I mean, if you look at the economy, the GDP of Benin is perhaps a tenth of the GDP of Paris. And, and therefore, when we are negotiating, and, and uh, this is where Nkrumah was not understood, but, uh, and, and therefore he lost the, 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 the argument on that day. People said, let us do it gradually. Let us do it regionally. East West Africa, then East Africa, then West, then, then Central Africa, then South Africa. And the net effect is that Europe and the French want Benin. They want a little Benin. They want a little Togo. They want a little Cameroon. They want a little Gabon. They want a little Equatorial Guinea. They want a little something South Bay and principally Cabo Verde, Guinea Bissau, Guinea Conakry. They want the Gambia, whether it's the French or the British. And I can't agree more with my good friend, Dr. Rikana Chihombri Kwao, that Africa must now begin into moving in the direction of dissolving these boundaries. Some people may say that that kind of argument is idealistic, sentimental, even naive, and there would be merit in that argument because there is a sense in which dissolving these countries, particularly from the political perspective, may not be as easy as, I'm, as I am saying. But if we focused on the economic issues, look at ECOWAS now. ECOWAS already coming up with ECO, the, the currency that would be used in the 14 East and West African countries. The French quickly came in, went to La Côte d'Ivoire, persuaded President Alison Ouattara, and they took over the ECO because they still want to control it from Paris. Look at East African community as I speak to you now. The East African Community Treaty says none of the countries should engage in unilateral negotiation with any power. My own country, Kenya, has entered into bilateral, unilateral bilateral negotiations with the United States and entered into a trade pact with the United Kingdom. Even in the face of the Africa continental free trade area, the erstwhile colonizer is still manipulating us. And in addition to them, there is now China. Of course. China asks the question, you thing. want a road, they give it to you. You want an apartment in Dubai, they give it to you. You want to have a room to gamble in Macau, they give it to you. You want your family to visit Beijing, they give it to you. You want to be in Thailand, in Bangkok, they give it to you, all to the detriment of your people. But once again, reverting to the question you asked at the very beginning, people are, it is the people who are going to move the boundaries. Yes. It is the Ugandans trading with the Tanzanians and Ugandans and, and, and Nigerians trading with the, with the Ghanaians and the Beninois and the Cameroonians that are going to force the issue. But you and me, particularly you, as the advantage of running a program such as this, you've got to give it the oxygen of publicity. You'll have no shortage of enemies, but who said there would be none? We must keep on pushing the envelope. It is Fidel Castro who said, you must keep on knocking the door. You never know when the door would, will give in. Keep on knocking. Your duty is to keep on knocking intergenerationally. Your generation knocks, the other generation knocks, and our business is in knocking and it, until it gives in. That is our duty. Exactly. And that leads me to this next question. Uh, again, some people, some of us in the Pan-Africanist, uh, especially living here in, in diaspora, uh, uh, feel that there is a need for, or, or should I ask you, is there a need for, uh, and you mentioned not civic education, uh, is there a need for an indoctrination of uh, young uh, continental and diaspora Africans in, in terms of bringing them on board to start thinking differently uh, going forward, especially 
um, the, let's take the United States of America, where there's a new leadership. Uh, the Democratic Party are taking over power over there. And uh, they seemingly are supposed to be the more accommodating party. And the influence of African Americans in, the, in, the, uh, in uh, U.S. policies going forward. Uh, do you think that we should make a special effort to reach out to African Americans uh, within that power structure that is the United States uh, for the benefit of Africa and in terms of uh, policies and, uh, and uh, aid or uh, whatever we can get from, from the United States, especially encountering the influence of China uh, and other powers? There is a sense in which uh, we must be very wary, not of African-Americans, but of all these Western countries. I mean, there may be a change uh, in the administration of the Democratic uh, Party, uh, replacing the Republican Party, but I'm never impressed by those, by those changes. My own view is, is that the foreign policy of the United States of America remains unchanged at all times. It is only in very superficial areas that we may see some kind of non-seismic change. And, and those are, are very uh, superficial and artificial and don't address the fundamentals. And in as much as we must guard against China, so must we guard against the conceptual West because the agenda is uniform. The agenda is the same to do things that they are in their best interest. It therefore behooves us, we who belong to the mother continent to work together and, and it's instructive that at one time, the African Union, which does very little, did recognize uh, Africans in the diaspora as the sixth region of the continent. And we are talking about African Americans in the United States of America. We are talking about those in the Caribbean, those in Brazil, those in North America generally, generally those in Europe, those in Australia. And if you remember, in the very early days in the struggle, during the struggle for independence, African Americans were very active. People like W.B. Du Bois, who went to Ghana and spent quite some time in Ghana. People like Martin Luther King Jr. People like Malcolm X and uh, Stockley Carmichael, who came from the islands. They were quite active. In fact, I would say that is only in the last few years that African Americans have not been as prominent as they ought to be, or if they have been rather lukewarm. I know my good friend, the Rever Reverend R. Sharpton is, is becoming quite active in, in Africa, Jesse Jackson was, and, and there is a sense in which they must be part of the solution. So it is incumbent upon us to make Africa attractive to them. Yes. And that is how I understand the initiative of the president of Ghana, President Ado Akufuado, when he created an emblematic year of return. Yes. That, that was emblematic and, and heraldic. Going forward, it must not just be an event. And I've seen quite a number of African-Americans now making the choice. We are going to settle in the Gambia. We are going to settle in Ghana. We are going to settle in, in Liberia or in Sierra Leone. So, in a single sentence, I'm saying, where, wherever Africans are, they have a duty to mother Africa. But there is always the argument that they should move out from where they are. They shouldn't. No, the don't. Caribbean islands are part of Africa by extension and spiritually. Who built the Caribbean islands? It is Africans who did so. You go to Trinidad and Tobago, you find Yoruba people. You find Igbo people. You go to certain places, you find the Temne and the Mende. You go to Brazil, you find the Ovambo and the Ovimbundu. So there is a sense in which this idea of return does not mean that we abandon those places. Those are oh, our places. And we must take care of them as much as we take care of the mother continent. Definitely, definitely. That is, uh, that is very profound and uh, very correct what you just said.